Stuttgart. Let's start with them. Um, do keep chasing Bayern Munich. And we have to kind of say it that way because Leverkusen are keep doing Leverkusen things. Um, and uh, still far and ahead in the Bundesliga table despite anything that Bayern Munich are doing. But Stuttgart just four points behind Bayern Munich still. You know, two bad results and they could go second. Um, also slowly but surely inching towards that Champions League spot. Um, they had some great news on top of their 2-0 win over Union Berlin last week with um, Sebastian Hoeneß renewing his contract, right? That ends speculations about his future. And I think um, at, a, at a time where you really want to put an end to those speculations, because with um, Bayern Munich um, waking up to reality and realizing that maybe ha just poaching Javi Alonso from Leverkusen isn't going to be quite as easy as they thought, they were, of course, looking at honor candidates and Sebastian Hoeneß was one of them. He's taking himself off the market, um, setting a really good sign here. I also wanted to call about the four potential uh, call-ups to the German national team, which I think is well-deserved. But let's start with Sebastian Hoeneß here. First, a new contract, then a win over Union Berlin. Been a pretty perfect week for Stuttgart. It's been an incredible week for Stuttgart. It's been an incredible season for Stuttgart. And... Um... I was actually, just as you were talking there, I had a quick thought in my head to see if Stuttgart are actually on course to beat their record points tally in the Bundesliga. And you'd have to go all the way back to the 2006-2007 season when they obviously won the league. They won that with 70 points and they're currently sitting on 53 points. So you'd have to take 18 points from the last nine games. of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9... Yeah, so 20 points from the next nine games, which means they can only drop another seven, which, to be perfectly honest with you, they've still got to play Leverkusen, they've still got to play Bayern, they've still got to play Dortmund, but, you know, you never know. And it would be quite remarkable, and it would I think it'd be a perfect example of just how good the Stuttgart side have been that um, if they were to actually finish with more points than the season they won the title... Um, it would really show just the kind of absolutely incredible kind of record-breaking form that they've been showing. Um, and yeah, they've been incredible. Um, you know, we've kind of, we've spent all season kind of singing their praises and I've just been so impressed with the way that Hone is, has kind of built a team that, if I'm being honest, and I wrote about this not that long ago, actually, in terms of how, if you actually look at the way the Stuttgart play their football, they're not entirely dissimilar to the way that, um, Leverkusen play football. Uh, they kind of they, they like to play possession football. They like to take their time. They like to be quite intricate with their passing. Um, they rely a lot on kind of getting into that final third, dominating the space, and then using their best players to do that. And boy, did we see that at the weekend with obviously you know Girassi scored a fantastic goal, and then Fulrich scoring an outstanding goal. Um, you know, for anyone who missed it. It was like a right-footed Aryan Robin, uh, to be honest with you, the way he kind of cut inside and just curled it in the back post. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about how, you know, well, we're now kind of talking and joking about how they might be able to now catch uh, Bayern, but I keep looking at the league table and thinking what Stuttgart have really done is they set the standard and they set a bar so high for both Leipzig and Borussia Dortmund. Um, you know, for the last kind of what well, I guess for the best part of 11 years now, we've been watching Dortmund really kind of struggle to establish themselves first as Germany's second best team and then as a potential title challenger for Bayern. And, you know, people like you and I, and I'm sure lots of people who listen to this podcast, whenever someone from England or Spain or Italy says, you know, um, Bayern dominate the Bundesliga because they buy all the best players and they have the best team and things like that. And, more often than not, we're left saying, well, actually, more often than not, it's actually Dortmund who are tripping up over their own feet. And Leverkusen have obviously made that abundantly clear what happens when you get your ducks in their own Bundesliga. But perhaps a slightly less extent, I think Stuttgart have is one as well because, you know, um, score more goals uh, from an attacking sense. I think they're more impressive as well. Defensively, I think they're more impressive as well. But they're also playing a different style of football from what Leipzig and Dortmund are playing. And... I just think they've completely leapfrogged both of those clubs and I think both Leipzig and Dortmund were probably looking at everything Stuttgart have done, both on and off the pitch, and wondering how they can emulate that next season because they've because Stuttgart have made a fool of both those teams. There's no there's no two ways about it. Yeah, I, I just um went through Hernes's managerial history 
um, and tried to find a parallel to um, Pep Guardiola. And of course I didn't <laughs> because um, although he has been at Bayern Munich for a long time, right, as a youth coach, he wasn't actually there when um, Pep was there. It was afterwards. Um, what I actually thought was really interesting, I, I didn't, maybe it was in the back of my head, but he was actually um, head of youth and a U17 coach at RB Leipzig when Rangnick was there, which is, of course, interesting, right? Because um, everything Rangnick, comes back to Rangnick. <laughs> everything comes back. It does. <laughs> It is actually kind of eerie. I mean, he he is the godfather of the back four in German football, right? Before Rangnick, the, the German football played with Libero, and then, of course, Rangnick changed that um, at Ulm and then later at Stuttgart um, before, of course, he built Hoffenheim and Leipzig to be what they are today. Um, and then he was at Bayern Munich, and that, that was actually during the time when um, Nico Kovac was already in charge, so I can't really draw parallels there. Um, it's interesting nonetheless because I don't actually I, you know why I was maybe surprised with the, the, the Leipzig thing is because I don't actually think he's playing typical Leipzig football hmm. yeah, I wouldn't say they're playing typical Leipzig football at all by any means um, you know you'd obviously have to ask him and even then he probably wouldn't admit as much but I do kind of wonder if maybe he's just taking a look at what Leverkusen are doing and thought well we can do that we can apply that to our system Um I think there's also just a simple aspect that when you start to dominate games the way that Stuttgart have, your, your football does eventually kind of begin to transform more into possession-based simply because you have the ball more often. You know, um, you know, I've actually got the stats in front of me and, and, and Dortmund and Leipzig, sorry, yeah, Dortmund and Leipzig do a lot more counter-attacks per game than Stuttgart. Now that could be because of the way they play or simply because they lose the ball more often than Stuttgart or they get teams attack them a lot more than Stuttgart. Um and you could also say the same that Dortmund obviously do a lot more pressing, they make a lot more tackles and things like that as well. So, you know, it's obviously up for debate, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to talk about Dortmund at one point uh, or later on in this podcast, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of Dortmund fans who'll tell you that first and foremost, their team do struggle to control games. And I think that's the biggest difference between them and Stuttgart. And that goes all the way back to these players who've obviously had an outstanding season and, and had an outstanding um, to the point that they're getting called up for like the German national team, for example. Um, we were actually talking about before we came on air there that um, the one player who's perhaps been just as impressive as anyone in Stuttgart is the one player who hasn't yet been confirmed as in Nagelsmann's squad, which is obviously Angelo Stiller, uh, who's been a bit of a revelation in that kind of um, Stuttgart midfield this season. But yeah, you can kind of go through that entire team man for man and they've all more or less improved remarkably under Hones. So whether it's tactics, whether it's individual players stepping up, whether Stuttgart are simply dominating teams, um, it's it, the proof's in the pudding, whichever way you look at it, to be honest with you. And I think, you know, Hones has just done a great job and he's been rewarded with a new contract, which I guess Manu means that, um, at least for now, it kind of pours some cold water over those rumours linking him with a return to Munich. Yeah, that's not happening anytime soon. I actually... <laughs> Um, spend some time thinking about it this weekend that this is actually in many ways a really remarkable Bundesliga season because I think we're in one of those watershed turning point times um, you know um, that could really define a new era in the way German football is headed um, and you know that I think that could actually also impact the national team and possibly positively but I'll get to that in a moment there is two teams in German football that play very different football than most German teams have in the past. And they're having enormous success with it. Stuttgart is one, Leverkusen is the other, of course. And I don't think we've seen that since Jurgen Klopp with Dortmund. That, of course, then ushered in this 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 era that is now ending. I actually think we're getting to uh, the end of an era here. Um, which is possibly a good thing because it might also usher in a new era that could also be positively impacting the German national team. Because I think um, the way certain teams are playing now is changing and you see more and more teams um, copying what Stuttgart and um, Leverkusen have been doing. A good example is Freiburg's 2-2 draw against Bayern. Another good example is actually Bochum's victory over, over Bayern that more teams are trying to find footballing solutions um, even against the very best teams and they're having success with it, right? And I think that is very much due to Alonso um, and Hoeneß, um showing it that it's possible over a long time. 
And I'm actually really curious to see how other coaches are going to to copy that. And then, of course, we get to now Julian Nagelsmann and calling up. Um, these are not confirmed. You know, um, maybe I'll shed some light on this. This is how it works in German football. And a lot of na national teams actually do this. The players will have been called up. And then the agents go on speed dial to their preferred journalists and basically tell them, oh, yeah, guess what? My agent XYZ was called up. Um, so that's why it's not confirmed. But, you know, you, you can basically um, look at the names that have been leaked and say, yeah, that's pretty sure um, things change because of injuries. Maybe someone has to, you know, there's last minute updates, etc. cetera. Uh, I think it's interesting that, uh, let's go to the players that were caught up. Waldemar Adenton, right? He's a little bit of a surprise to me, although that probably means Schlotterbeck isn't in it, which is well-deserved. Um, Undaf, I mean, that's an open secret. We all know Undaf was going to be called up. He has been, in many ways, one of Germany's best strikers in the Bundesliga. Um, Führig, you know, again, he's been part of the national team already. You compared him to Robben. Um, you know, his form has been um, absolutely stellar. And then the fourth is Mittelstadt. Um, you know, and that makes sense because that's a wingback solution that Germany um, needs. Although I think, you know, um, Kimmich is, of course, occupying one of those two positions. Um, the one that's not been named yet, doesn't mean he's not in it, um, is Angelo Stiller, Stefan. Um, who in, I think, I mean, I wrote about Stiller earlier this year um, and his importance for this team and how he has basically made Endo a forgotten man uh, in Stuttgart. That doesn't mean Endo's not a good player. If you're a Liverpool fan, I, I, I totally appreciate he is. It's just that they brought in Stiller and he's doing the job just as well. Um, that's a name that kind of stood out as not being called up. But although, you know, if you're calling up Tony Kroos, where are you putting Angelo still? <laughs> yeah, I think it's actually a good it's a good example or a good ref reflection rather of where Bayern do and don't have strength. Uh, sorry, not Bayern, Germany do or don't have strength. Um, obviously, Anton's getting called up because Nagelsmann's still kind of desperately looking for a solid defensive pairing. As you said, Schlotterbeck actually more or less confirmed he's not in the squad at a press conference today, actually. Um, and he, he was a little myst mystified by that because he thinks he's been consistent. Um, be interesting to see what Dortmund fans think of that. I'm not sure they'd agree. Um, as you said, Mittelstadt softly in there as a left back um, because you know uh, Bayern do have left back. Don't know why I keep saying Bayern. Germany do have left back issues. Well, Bayern have left back two, issues too. <laughs> but the two used to be synonymous, ones. not anymore. Yeah, exactly. But used to be exactly. Synonymous. <laughs> exactly. I mean, obviously, Bayern, uh, Germany do have left backs. You know, David Rams is a good yeah. example, but I don't think that's nailed on. Um, yeah. And you know, Fulrick as well as a left winger is a, a good show as well because well, there there are they just need more options really in attacking. I, I think someone like Chris Fulrick's simply been too good to avoid. To be perfectly honest with you, yeah. in that regard, so. Um, and that's his third call up in a row too. Yeah, I you mean, know. you could make the same case for Alexander Nobel, of course, for not, for apparently not being in the squad simply because Germany do have goalkeepers as well. So there's it, it's it's a good example of how Nagelsmann's maybe kind of using the Stuttgart squad. He's kind of picking and choosing the players he wants from it to fill in the gaps in his squad. And yeah, I, you you it'd be very hard pressed to kind of say no one really deserves that. You know, I think particularly Al, uh, Anton's been a really under rated or he's kind of really floor on the radar even in Stuttgart I'm sure Stuttgart fans appreciate him but you know people will say who's been the best centre back in the in the Bundesliga this season probably find very few people to say Anton and I think he certainly would be up there um, his stats certainly suggest as much as well so um, no they, they, they've all done tremendously well and, and, and hopefully they get a shot to, to prove that with Germany well you know usually too is like if as a centre back you are not in the headlines that's kind of a good thing. You know what I mean? It sounds kind of weird, but like Schlotterbeck, I actually think Schlotterbeck is a fantastic football player. You know, he has all the skills and talent in the world. Um, he's an incredible football player. And pardon my French, but he's a sh been sh a shit defender this year. <laughs> you know, like the two things can exist at the same time. A, you can be a fantastic football player and actually still be terrible at what you've been doing. And I think that actually fits Schlotterbeck. It fits him so well. And I actually do think, you know, we're seeing this with Jonathan Tarr, who's playing an incredible season. You know, sometimes center backs, especially the ones that can actually play football, take a long time to develop. Another good example is um, Jerome Boateng. 
you know, how long, how many years did we criticize Jerome Boateng until he won a World Cup for Germany in 2014, right? Um, so that happens with center backs, but Schlotterbeck saying that um, he thinks he's been consistent. I mean, he has been consistently bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, is this a good? Yeah. Is this a good way to transition onto the Dortmund game, perhaps? <laughs> Yeah, in, in, in a mode because like uh, I I have one more theory on why Stiller isn't called up, and that's um, I think it's because uh, Nagelsmann is calling up Pavlovich. Yeah, possibly. I would also maybe just say that look, Nagelsmann is only in the job for the summer. He's not here to bleed uh, young players. He's not here to provide a a nurturing nest for the stars of tomorrow. He's here to win this competition with the German national team. And if that means he's calling up, you know, 27-year-old veteran, uh, grizzled Bundesliga veteran Anton over the slick Schlotterbeck, then that's what he's going to do because he's like, I, I, need, a, I need a guy who'll get stuck in and not someone who'll lose the ball 20 yards from his own box because he's trying to play a Hollywood pass. And and I think that's a perfect example. And someone like Angelo Stiller obviously has a bright future with the German national team, but the fact, I mean, you're right. Maybe, maybe it's because Pavlovich has been brought in because he's obviously been in um, He's got a lot of um, interest from. I think it's Croatia. Is it the second Serbia. nationality? Serbia. Sorry, Serbia. my apologies. Yeah. Um, but there's obviously the fact that Gundogan will still be there. Tony Cruz will still be there. I'm trying my best not to turn this into a Germany national team podcast. To be perfectly honest with you, but um, yeah, I think Stiller doesn't have much to worry about. I'm sure you'll have plenty of game time for the German national team in the years to come. Yeah. Tony, I th- I'm pretty sure this is Tony Kroos's last uh, tournament, and then their their the path uh, pathway for Stiller will be wide open. I, I have a really good transition to Borussia Dortmund for you, Can, Stefan. Before you do, actually, uh, just one more thing I want to say about Sebastian Hones on the kind of new contract and the kind of Bayern rumors. If you actually look at the Stuttgart squad and the star players in it, the thing that's really outstanding to me are really notable uh, and outstanding from a Stuttgart point of view is that. Just about all the key players are on long-term contracts. I've got in front of me, I just want to talk about before we move on, uh, Gurasi, tied down until 2026, Endo Milo, 2028. Although Gurasi has the exit clause. Of course, he has an exit clause, of course, but we'll see about that. Hiroki Eto, 2027, Furik, 2028, Undav, uh, it's obviously a buy uh, clause in his contract that they could sign in this summer. Angel Stiller, 2027. Anton, 2027. Sagadu, 2026. Silas, 2026. On and on and on. Mittelstadt, 2026. More or less, you know, um, Hones's top 10 players all have contracts that run two, three, four years into the future. And you really can't overstate how important it is for the Stuttgart side. This club has been like a merry-go-round or a carousel, whatever you want to call it, with players coming and going, coming and going constantly uh, over the course of the years. It's why they've been this yo-yo club. It's why they've gone up and down um, to the point that they've had kind of even like huge open fiascos with sporting directors, directors of sport, blah, 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 even club presidents over the way that players have come and left. The fact that all these players are tied down to long contra- long-term contracts, I think was a huge factor in Hones agreeing to stay at the club. Not to say that some of them might move on or the fact that Stuttgart might feel compelled to sell some of them. Of course, that's just the nature of football. But the fact that they can pick and choose who goes and that's this team who've actually achieved already something remarkable uh, this season will more or less be intact, uh, I think is one of the main reasons it's honed as a steam put. Yeah. I mean, um, there is some some rumblings at Stuttgart in the, in the EV, which is the membership club, but... When isn't there rumblings in a full membership club? Um, as long as the players are all signed to long-term contracts, I think that's good. Now, you think, you know, if you reach the Champions League, even someone like Garassi could could be convinced to stay put. Um, and I think that's quite interesting um, as well to see what happens with Stuttgart. 